Thank you for joining me on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Total Synthesis episode, we'll be going through the Baron Group's recent total synthesis of Maximycin. There's a lot today, so let's get right to it. Maximycin is a natural product that lies at the intersection of three biosynthetic pathways. It is a pyridone alkaloid that's been shown to activate DNA damage response pathways and has also shown cytotoxic efficacy against a type of triple negative breast cancer. Maximycin exists as an equilibrating mixture of atrope isomers as a result of the hindered rotation around the bond shown in green. The authors of this paper devised a convergent synthesis that led back to these two fragments using four key tactics. First, they recognized that the pyridone may be able to be constructed using a kind of non-traditional guareshi thorpe type condensation. This tactic is important because it lets you disconnect the final target into two fragments of approximately equal complexity. Their idea with this tactic is to take advantage of the electron flow that we see in the azosaccharide reaction, where the silicon plays a critical role in allowing a nucleophilic attack. The second key tactic they relied on was a decarboxylative Giese addition followed by a 1,5-hydrogen atom transfer, or HAT, cascade. In this tactic, we oxidize a carboxylate starting material, or intermediate, and use a decarboxylation to generate an alkyl radical that can be trapped in a radical conjugate addition to a vinyl sulfone. The second part of this tactic is a 1,5 hat that ultimately allows the oxidation of a nearby alcohol to an aldehyde. A third tactic they used was the desymmetrization of a substituted cyclohexane bearing diastereotopic methyl groups via a CH functionalization reaction, which is an idea that falls under the umbrella of diastereotopic group discrimination, but we'll get more into that in a second. The final tactic they envisioned was the idea of accessing this kind of all-cis substituted cyclohexane via an all-sin reduction of an appropriate aromatic precursor. So first, let's take a look at fragment 1 and go through the steps they used to access that. Starting from mesitylene carboxylic acid, they used Adams catalyst to carry out hydrogenation to obtain the all-cis meso acid. Then, treatment with oxaloyl chloride and catalytic DMF activated the carboxylic acid for coupling with the chiral directing group shown. It's important to note that in this product, once we've attached the chiral directing group, the methyl groups on the left and right are now diastereotopic. This opens up the possibility for selectively discriminating between them without introducing further chiral information. This becomes critical in the next step, which I want to introduce and then talk about in some more detail afterwards. With the help of the chiral directing group, which had to be optimized, they carried out a palladium catalyzed CH activation that resulted in selectively methoxylating the left methyl group. To fully appreciate this diastereotopic group discrimination event, I want to interrupt myself for a brief aside. First, we should acknowledge that the word desymmetrization is really quite vague and could be applied in a wide range of chemical contexts. The specific type of desymmetrization that's happening in this paper is a desymmetrization of diastereotopic groups, which is a kind of local desymmetrization. This kind of desymmetrization differs from nantioselective desymmetrization, which has also been called global desymmetrization. This distinction is described in the review at the bottom where we can see some of the different synthetic applications that local desymmetrization through diastereotopic group discrimination has found. In order to put this total synthesis in context, I want to quickly look at some categories that have been proposed for local desymmetrization. In this overview, we're going to mark the pro-stereogenic centers in orange and new stereogenic centers in green. In the category 1 local desymmetrization, which is a simple group selection, the diastereotopic group discrimination results in the formation of a single stereocenter by altering the identity of one of the diastereotopic groups, which we've marked with the red balls. In the category 2 local desymmetrization, the diastereotopic group selection is accompanied by addition to an unsaturated functional group, which can result in setting more stereocenters than in category 1. In the category 3 local desymmetrization, which is conceptually a little bit different than the last two, the diastereotopic group discrimination is accompanied by the conversion of a chirotopic non-stereogenic center to a stereocenter. This is the complex category of local desymmetrization that Barron's CH methoxylation and the maximizing total synthesis falls into. We can see this if we go back to the CH functionalization reaction for a moment. Applying the conceptual framework we talked about a minute ago, we can see how four stereocenters are being defined in this step. Here I'm saying stereogenic centers defined rather than new stereogenic center for the green balls, just to firmly acknowledge that the methyl groups on the left and right hand side of the substrate are already attached to stereocenters. It's not that we're creating new stereocenters, it's that we're making the stereocenters on the left and right in the starting material into stereocenters that don't add up to a meso compound when we remove the directing group. Furthermore, and pause the video if you want to because there is really a lot going on here, we're converting two non-stereogenic chirotopic centers marked in orange into stereocenters marked in green. For more on the distinction between chirotopicity and stereogenicity, check out this paper by Mislow and Siegel at the bottom. So, moving on. They removed the directing group by treating with HBr, which resulted in the formation of this lactone. They were able to recover 80% of the directing group as the free base during this step. 
Now, in order to execute a one carbon homologation and fix the stereochemistry of the stereocenter alpha to the carbonyl, they hydrolyzed the lactone with sodium hydroxide and carried out a decarboxylative Giese addition, followed by a 1,5 hydrogen atom transfer in a cascade that delivered this sulfone product. Here's another step that required a lot of optimization that's detailed in their supporting information. The really interesting part of this reaction is that the radical generated by the Giese addition underwent a 1,5 hydrogen atom transfer to result in an alpha oxy radical that could be oxidized to give an aldehyde in the product, which fits right into the synthetic plan because the next thing they did was a Wittig reaction to form the terminal alkene. A subsequent aerobic oxidation of the sulfone formed the carboxylic acid, which could be trapped with dimethyl sulfate to form the methyl ester. Now they used Mander's reagent followed by a hydrolysis step to convert the ester into a malonic acid moiety, going through the dimethyl malonate intermediate. At this point, this fragment was complete, so let's take a quick pause to see how they made the other fragment. Once again, this is fragment 2, which we saw briefly at the beginning. To make this fragment, they started with this epoxide, which can be made in five reported steps from shikamic acid. They opened the epoxide with Bach-protected hydroxylamine, then treated with TFA to deprotect the Bach group, followed by TBS protection of the secondary alcohol, going through the ammonium trifluoroacetate intermediate. Then, condensation of the amine onto this alpha-TMS acetaldehyde piece gave fragment 2, ready for coupling. To get the fragments together, they took fragment 1 and activated it as the diacyl chloride, then introduced it to fragment 2 as well as silver triflate. This allowed them to activate the electrophile further as the diacyl triflate, which could be attacked in his homosaccharide fashion with fragment 2. After acylating on one side with the nitrogen, the enamine that resulted from TMS cleavage was used as a nucleophile to attack the other acyl triflate and close up the pyridone ring. This product existed as a one-to-one -one mix of atrope isomers due to hindered rotation around the bond marked in green. Finally, treatment with TFA and methanol allowed a global deprotection to arrive at maximycin. Overall, a very interesting synthesis, totaling 10 steps in the longest linear sequence, with some very imaginative and instructive steps. Thank you for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it, please support us by liking and subscribing, and feel free to send us any questions and comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time!